Well, first of all, I um, just want to say it's been, uh, it's been uh, an amazing few days. I want to thank all the guys at uh, Catalyst Week and Catalyst Creative, um, everybody that's come from all the different corners of North America. Um, it's just a, it's been an amazing experience and I'm very glad to be part of this. So that's uh, uh, what, what I wanted to talk about is, um, and this is, you know, three days of staying up till two in the morning. So if I start to flag a little bit, then just give me a quick poke or something, I'll wake up again. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about Red Academy and what we're doing, and you guys have obviously heard some of this already, and um, also talk a bit, Matt's going to come up and talk more about our educational approach. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of the backstory, and um, you know, Evelyn, you asked me to talk a bit about myself and that vulnerability thing that, Katie, I'm exactly the same, like, am I willing to be vulnerable? Uh, not so much. So <laughs> um, but anyway, we'll... Um, I'll give you a quick run through, but we'll start with a, with, a, with a quote here from Aristotle. Education is the best provision for life's journey. Um, and of course, every journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. And my first steps began here in Holland. Um, I moved around a lot as a kid, so I lived in lots of different places, saw lots of different parts of the world. And uh, yeah, and it's kind of stayed in my blood. So um, in 2001, I, I moved to London, which is kind of where I also spent some time growing up, um, and started my career, worked at different agencies. And everyone, when they think of London, they think of this. They think of this beautiful city, and the reality is that London looks a lot more like this. And uh, so really, after, after about seven years working at different agencies and startups and all sorts of fun stuff, I decided to start my own journey. Um, I met a Canadian girl. Uh, bought a car in Toronto, drove across the country, um, then picked up this beauty, which is uh, Mystique. It's a trimaran, 33-foot trimaran. Um, funny story, because the boat was for sale, and I couldn't obviously buy it without seeing it. And uh, so I said to the owner, hey, look, I'll just rent it off you for the summer, and then if I like it, then I'll, I'll buy it. And um, at the end of the summer, we would run out of money, so I couldn't buy it, but... Um, <laughs> He, he didn't know that. But anyway, so um, <laughs> we, uh, we, we set out, and it was a kind of crazy thing to do because we, we said, okay, we'll, we'd like to get to Alaska, and Alaska's quite far away from BC, for those of you know where either of those places are. Um, <laughs> so the, bo the boat's quite small as well, 33 feet's not very big. It's literally, this is kind of the size of the living compartment. And uh, yeah, 5,000 kilometers on that boat. We blew up the engine after two weeks. Um, and we jury-rigged a little outboard engine on the side and decided to keep going. We bro almost broke the mast at one point. There's lots of, lots of um, issues. And, and a lot of people that would say, look, you can't really go to Alaska in that thing. There's people on luxury yachts with running tap water and stuff like that, all those luxuries. And uh, they were just like, look, you're crazy. And then I'd say, well, you know, how far have you been? And if they said, well, you know, I've been to Alaska, then I'd, I'd listen to them. But if they said, oh, well, uh, I've only been just, just a little while up the coast, then I'd be like, well, that's... I don't, I don't believe you. I'm going to give it a try anyway. So um, we, did, we did get to Alaska, but um, this is something that sticks with me. And we're setting off on a journey with Red at the moment. We're at the very beginning of a, of a journey, you know, metaphorical journey. Um, but really, this is the most important thing that I learned from that, is that to, to actually get anywhere, you've just got to take the next step. And the first step is to leave the harbor. So that's us in Alaska. Well, that's the boat. That's Mystique. Um, we saw some beautiful stuff. Saw whales and icebergs and... Um, and a few bears, um, and just, I mean, to try and summarize a four-month trip in a couple of slides, it's very difficult, but, um, you know, amazing, amazing life-changing experience. Four months later, came back to Vancouver, a uh, beautiful city. If you haven't been, you should definitely come visit. Uh, it's just an amazing place. I worked at lots of different agencies um, before, in 2012, we started Drive. Miles is here, he's, uh, who is now running the show. Um, Drive is 25 people. We have just won some more awards. It's just an amazing team of people. Um, but we kind of did it so well that I kind of ended up without a job. So I was kind of twiddling my thumbs a bit because these guys are doing such a great job. And said, you know, well, what's the next challenge? And, and the, one of the big challenges we have in tech, and I think every person that works in tech understands, getting talent is the most difficult thing to do. And we've just seen that there's a huge gap that's starting to appear between people that are in industry and then people coming out of education. Um, in Canada, and I don't know what the stats are in the States, but you know, f by what I hear, there's, um, 
there's high unemployment. We've got 15% underemployment or unemployment in the under 30s. So that's very high. It's the highest it's been for living memory. Um, so, you know, this question, where do we find great people? Well, in Vancouver, we've got 15,000 technology jobs coming. And we have companies like Microsoft moving in there, putting 100,000 square foot space in. Um, Telus Garden is a huge project in the downtown, 200,000 square feet. So there's lots of jobs, but there's just not enough people. Um, so those are the companies that we all know, but actually the reality is, is that the majority of the economy is made up of small businesses. So there are lots and lots and lots of tech companies out there that we don't know their names necessarily, but they are the majority of the industry. So, you know, three and a half thousand job openings right now in tech, that's from our own research. Um, just some stats from code.org, by 2020, and this is in the States, there will be 1.4 million new jobs for developers. Um, at the moment, the current education system is only producing 400,000 graduates. So we're a million short. I'm not saying we're going to do all of that. Um, you know, and outside of developers, you've also got what we call the ABCs. So those are the architects, the builders, and the communicators. So just to jump back, so those are designers, developers, and marketers, right? So when you think of architects, builders, communicators, you think of an architect and a builder and a communicator. I'm not quite sure what that is, but... Something along those lines. Um, but really, um, you've got to look at the tech world and say, well, this is the forefront. This is, this is the, the very cutting edge of what we're doing as a, as a species, right? The internet is the biggest thing we've ever done. So if architects, we should think of these kind of people, you know, builders, that's Tesla. And those are the communicators. And if these people were alive right now, they'd be working in tech. And they'd be communicating in tech. So back to that question, where do we find great people? So you've got traditional education. Um, we've talked about that a bit. And this is the traditional route. So you go to school, you get good grades, you get university, you get a job. And then this last little bit, you make money, and that should make you happy. And that's another discussion for another day, I think. Um, but, I mean, the reality is, is that you look at the big success stories of today, and they're not coming out of education. These guys all quit college and went and started a business. Richard Branson's another one, Larry Ellison. They, they, the education system isn't working for these people and they are the biggest successes of today. So that suggests that something broken. And what it has to do with is the pace of technology. So I'm sure you guys have all seen this, this sort of Ray Kurzweil idea that, the, that we're in an accelerating pace. Um, so you, you look at the telephone, right? This is the landline. So it took 80 years for it to get from you know zero to over 80%. Mobile phones, smartphones, this is what we're doing now. So you've got the Internet of Things. We're roughly here. And it's just, it's, you know, in the next three years, you're going to double the amount of devices online. So it's a massive, massive explosion in technology. So on top of that, the other issue is that information with a lot of innovation means that technologies, they'll get evolved and then they'll collapse and die. So in, th in one year, 30% of what you might learn in technology will be irrelevant a year later. So if you do three years in education, then you know, a lot of the world has changed. Universities, they're not in contact with industry. They're, they're doing their job. They're educating people. But they're not having their finger on the pulse and keeping up with what industry needs. On top of that, computer science is actually only a very small percentage of the science graduates that are coming out. This is another stat from code.org. So if you look jobs versus students, there's a huge disparity in terms of what's being produced by the universities. So option two, you've got the boot camps. Um, so boot camps have cropped up a lot in the last few years. They're, they're all, over, all over North America. You're seeing them in every city in the world. And this is, this is often what you'll see. Become a full stack developer in eight weeks. Now, any developer you speak to will just find that quite offensive. Because it's like saying you can become a doctor in eight weeks. It's the, there's so much to learn. And we've tried hiring from these programs at Drive. And we just get generalists who know a small amount about a lot of things, but not enough to actually be useful in the workforce. And we need to now spend another six months of one of our senior developers sitting down and training them, which is very expensive, and it shouldn't be the onus on the company to, to be doing the job of education. So, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, and also, you need to be teaching the right technology. So these boot camps are all teaching Ruby on Rails, there's Python. Some of them are kind of reflecting what technology really needs. 
which is PHP. The blue section here is PHP. The internet is on PHP. WordPress is like the majority of uh, 70, 70 million websites, which is uh, two-thirds of all CMS-driven websites are running on WordPress, but nobody's teaching it. They're also not teaching UX and design. And I mean, personally, <laughs> This, this is what I think of when people don't think of design. It's beautifully built, but it doesn't work. And you see that all the time, the stuff that comes out of the boot camps. It's like the technology works, but it's completely unusable to a human being. So it's, uh, like it's frustrating to see it because you think it could be designed better. And the other thing is that nobody thinks about audience. They think, well, I'm going to build this thing, and then I'm going to sell it for a billion dollars. But you're like, well, how are people going to use it? How are you going to tell the story of what it is that you're doing? So, you know... This is the sort of famous last words of every failed entrepreneur is like, I built this amazing product, but I had no idea how to actually bring it to the world. So, you know, it's focusing on builders and not architects and communicators. So, you know, we started Red Academy. We said, okay, we'll look, we'll, we'll address this huge issue um, and with the single purpose that is to create highly employable graduates for the tech industry. I'm going to hand it to Matt. Matt's our head of operations, very talented chap, and he's going to tell us a bit more about how we do that. Thanks, Colin. Um, great. So I guess um, I wouldn't mind starting with actually a little secret. We are called Red Academy uh, because of this bold statement called redefining education. And we do fully appreciate the, the, how audacious that is for us to sort of make that claim. But it's something that we're all quite excited about and, and what keeps us coming back uh, uh, sort of work and, and putting in sort of the hours that we are. So um, to fully appreciate what would redefining education mean, I think we need to first take a look at what is education uh, status quo at this point. So um, I saw a, a, an article on uh, Facebook today. It was Robert De Niro. He was giving a commencement speech at uh, the Chish School of Arts at uh, NYU. And his uh, speech opening remarks were, uh, the, the class of 2015, congratulations. You made it, and you're fucked. <laughs> um, so I mean, a little tongue in cheek, but I, I think there's sort of a lot of truth in there. When you start looking at sort of the traditional uh, educational uh, methods, most people think of something similar to this, where it's a large lecture hall, you have your sage on the stage that's sort of teaching in a very one-way, non-adaptive method um, with students that are dozing off and not re retaining as much as they really could or should be. So. Taking a look at Drive Digital, where most of the learning uh, really occurs in, are in situations similar to this. And it's not uncommon for people to say, uh, actually, sort of, I think everyone says something similar to this uh, within their first job in their career, which is, I learned more in my first three months at, at blank than I did in my entire degree. So what can we do to replicate this uh, environment where you are uh, an absolute sponge taking in information, skills, competencies, uh, uh, to prepare people for uh, a career that they find very empowering, creative, uh, and exciting. So um, one thing that has been actually a theme of this weekend has been intrinsic motivation. So what is it that, that drives us? And learning is it's, it's a really an interesting space to be innovating in just because there's quite a lot of research, but learning itself is a bit of a black box. Like no one has any absolutes in that. Um, but taking a look at a broad, broad, broad uh, swath of, of research, as well as consulting with some thought leaders uh, in this environment, there's one thing that consistently comes up, which is that the most highly correlated variable with exceptional learning outcomes is a student's learner motivation. And what that means is how long is someone willing to stick with a problem that's a little bit outside of their comfort zone, a little bit beyond their skill set? How many different solutions are they willing to try out for a problem that they actually don't have an answer for? And that's what we're trying to foster at Red Academy. And there's five different things that um, we're doing to, to facilitate that. Number one is personalized education. So um, that's personalized education is kind of a buzzy word right now in, in the sort of the education realm. But really, it's not just about tailoring the curriculum to each student. It's also about tailoring the delivery systems that we have, as well as the support systems. So uh, one way that sort of makes us able to do this is the fact that we have a six to one student to teacher ratio. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible at all. So every time a student comes into Red Academy at that point of intake, they sit down with an instructor and, and you go through what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? What are some things that you've had struggles with during your educational career? 
so we then understand what your learning preferences are so we can adapt our teaching methods to each student. Um, another thing that's quite buzzy is this term called flipped classroom, but it's just about allowing students to have their first pass through the content uh, be on their own, which allows them to sort of uh, take that information in, in a way that is uh, uh, most um, effective for them, uh, as well as sort of they're allowed to sort of um, adjust the pacing of, of how they're taking in information. The second piece is holistic approach. You can have the most fantastic teacher with the absolutely perfectly cr uh, crafted lesson plan and, and curriculum and whatnot, but if you're learning in an environment that's just horrendous and you're sort of uh, uh, expected to be taking in information for eight hours uh, uh, straight, you're not gonna be uh, uh, as effective as possible. So we have uh, this agency style environment where you're actually facilitating peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, we have these things called 40-minute learning loops because there's a lot of research showing that after 40 minutes, people just kind of zonk out and you're not, you're not really learning anything. Um, yoga in the morning because uh, people, tr like without something to start the morning off, you're not really retaining anything before 10, 10.30. I know I'm never at least. Um, the second piece, or sorry, the third piece is that everything that's taught is extremely relevant. So to take the analogy of um, you're a, a medical student in residency and you're learning about sort of the top five things to detect um, early stages of, of cancer versus um, I'm trying to learn the birth date of Napoleon. Uh, <laughs> there's a huge difference in retention and students are, are their motivation to learn is uh, exponentially higher if they know that everything that's being taught uh, it will be of use to them. So something that we do, we have industry partners which we consult with. Um, all of our instructors are from industry, uh, and all of the work that students are working on are actually sourced from community partners. So for example, we're working with Aboriginal Tourism in BC. Um, there's so many amazing spots all throughout our, our beautiful province, um, and no one really knows about them. So there, we're, we have a, sort of a supply of over 600 websites um, that our students are gonna be working on to make sure that their UX, their, 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 um, the design, everything is beautiful, as well as they're their communicating their story. And there's a, sh there's a shift in your approach when you're working on a project, when you know that there's actually gonna be end users that are seeing it, they're, they're actually using it, uh, uh, and you're gonna t go that extra mile uh, uh, to ensure that sort of it's a, a proper reflection of the abilities that you have. And then the last piece is community-based learning. I think everyone really can um, appreciate that we, we really learn from other people as well as from teaching other people. So we've blended our subjects quite, uh, quite a lot. So um, if I'm a student in UX, I also have the opportunity to work with people that are on the front end development stream. So in turn, you have the front end developer who is then better appreciating the principles of UX, while also the UX student is now further establishing their understanding of UX and those principles because Everyone, again, appreciates that you're, you're, you must dive deeper into the knowledge uh, to be able to then teach someone. Um, and then sort of uh, a solid sort of format of, of, of mem mentorship from people from industry. So um, I guess sort of the, the, the call to action, if you will, is that uh, it's really exciting times. Uh, I think that if you, <laughs> not to get too sort of like uh, uh, serious here, but I was chatting with Sandy, I guess, Chatting with Sandy when you have to give a talk later that day is a dangerous thing because um, <laughs> you're tended to to want to wanna change everything. But yeah, he's got a lot of ideas, as Amy also found. But there's a lot of parallels between um, I think the situation that we're we're facing right now and uh, what was happening in in the early 1940s, which was that sort of population scientists were forecasting massive amounts of population growth, but obviously um, at that time. Uh, the sort of carrying capacity of the earth, our agri agricultural production, which just wasn't keeping pace. And there is projected uh, uh, of over a billion people that we're gonna starve to death <laughs> over the next uh, 100 years. And what happened was that a broad, broad collection of people and, and thought leaders in the area came together um, and started to uh, uh, innovate. And ultimately it was uh, a fellow by the name of Norman Borlaug who created the Green Revolution and is credited with saving over a billion people's lives. And I'm not just saying that um, Red Academy is gonna save a billion lives, but um, I, th I do think that there is a serious problem right now in that um, the need for highly educated people is actually only gonna continue to grow um, while the, the traditional education path is remained fairly stagnant 
um, for centuries. So if you're excited by this prospect uh, of redefining education, I, I urge you to reach out to us. Um, there's a lot of potential. We are right now in Vancouver and want to expand uh, um, across the world uh, and look forward to working with you uh, if that's something that interests you as well. Thank you.